So I dreamed about how I would use all those technologies before they were invented. So as soon as they were invented, I, I was primed to go out and to start to use them to see in what ways I could now um, apply laboratory phenomena and actually improve um, exam performance. So that was the environment in which first I had success and then I've mentioned I had failure, which got me to look around and say, oh, the un the unintended social consequences of, of smartphones, which had led to unintended um, cognitive and, um, and classroom effects of, uh, of, small, of smartphones. That was Arnold Glass, professor of cognitive psychology at Rutgers University. Much of Arnold's research has focused on the psychology and neuroscience of learning, and particularly on how teacher instructions affect learning and memory. And that's what we'll be discussing today. I think research has changed the world by helping us to ask questions about things we take for granted. I think that's a super interesting question, psychologically, but also sociologically. Every day, everywhere, some scientist is doing something that's just about to change the world. Welcome to How Researchers Change the World, a podcast series supported by Taylor and Francis which will demonstrate the real-world relevance, value, and impact of academic research and highlight the people and stories behind the research. My name is Dr. Caitlin Regeer. I'm an academic researcher, an author, and a scholar of digital and modern culture. And I'm interested in how new technologies can broaden the reach and real-world impact of academic research. In today's episode... We're speaking with Arnold Glass and exploring his research into the use of technology in the classroom. Specifically, we'll be unpacking his 2018 paper, Dividing Attention in the Classroom Reduces Exam Performance. Arnold's research has centered on the field of cognitive psychology, that is, the scientific study of human mental processes, such as attention, perception, memory, thinking, and creativity, and how these processes affect behavior. It's a field you're likely to have heard of by now, and tends to be a key focus of college and university courses in psychology. But that wasn't always the case. When Arnold first started exploring the world of psychological research— Cognitive psychology didn't even exist. I came along just at the time when psychology was undergoing a revolution. So um, as late as 1967, um, if you went to study psychology in college, you studied either experimental psychology or social psychology or maybe clinical psychology. But... Uh, Previous, but in 67, a book had been written called Cognitive Psychology by uh, a professor by the name of Ulrich Neiser, and that had sparked a revolution. And over the next four years, um, psychology departments had were transformed. They all had cognitive psychology programs for the first time, and cognitive psychology became um, a driving intellectual force over the next um uh, 40 years. Ulrich Neisser is widely referred to as the father of cognitive psychology, and he was the first person to hypothesize that a person's mental processes could be measured and therefore analyzed. Before Neisser, the dominant approach to understanding human behavior was behaviorism, which assumed that all behaviors are either a response to the environment around us or a consequence of our history as a person. It's still an approach that is used today, but it only gives a partial view of the reality because it focuses solely on what can be observed and ignores other factors such as thoughts and emotions. So you can see why Neisser's work was so revolutionary. In 1967, he released the book Cognitive Psychology. It challenged the assumptions of behaviorism 
and it presented his alternative. It was an instant success, and it transformed the way psychology was taught. And Arnold was right there during this transformation. So coming in right at the beginning of this, um, I could see what everyone else could see, that the that there were great things to be done in, in study of human cognition. So I picked that up right from the day I was interested in psychology. I wasn't just interested in psychology. I was interested in cognitive psychology, and, and I've been uh, carried along by that wave ever since. Within cognitive psychology, Arnold's work has specifically focused on learning and memory. As a lecturer and teacher himself, his research has had personal relevance, too, in terms of how he teaches his own classes. I always thought that if there's anyone in academics who should be able to teach an effective college course, it should be someone who's spending their life studying, learning, and memory, right? That I had a special obligation that if they should learn any courses, I should apply what I knew and they should do well in, in my course. Interestingly, Arnold also views his own classroom as a sort of experimental laboratory. His aim is always that his students get the best grades they possibly can in their exams, and he likes to test different methods to ensure he's giving them the best shot he can as their teacher. My entire classroom is this ongoing test bed in which I investigate new instructional methodologies. Um, in the, for many years, as I introduced new instructional methodologies, it was very gratifying to see students were doing better and better every single year. But about 10 years ago, their performance um, began plateau. They were no longer getting better. In fact, their performance in the in on exams began to decline and then declined significantly. Um, so this was of concern to me. Naturally, Arnold wanted to understand why the exam performance of his students was starting to decline and if he could rectify it. So he started to investigate. One thing that quickly became apparent to him was that students were looking up at him less during lectures. It might sound insignificant, but for Arnold, it was the start of a hypothesis for why students' exam performances were suffering. Now, one obvious um, reason why performance had started to decline was up until about 10 years ago when I would um, prepare my lectures or demonstrations for the classroom that were all part carefully constructed so that they would learn the material and do well in the exam, students would look up at me when I was lecturing and they would put all their effort into the demonstrations. But what had changed now is that the students in the classroom were only occasionally looking up at me. They were spending their primary time paying attention to their cell phone or their tablet or their laptop, no matter what was going on in the classroom. So they had turned the classroom experience from um, a single task experience into a divided attention task. For Arnold, this discovery was particularly frustrating because he had had such high hopes previously for how technological advances could enhance learning for his students. Through the last century, I really dreamed about the kind of technology that's become available in this century, um, in particular, um, personal response systems, clickers, so you could continually interact with the classroom and continually get responses so you knew what they learned at every single moment, and um, course platforms, so you'd know how much time they were studying, what they were studying, and what they knew then, because you could ask questions online, which they would answer. You would have everything time-stamped. Um, so I dreamed about how I would use all those technologies before they were invented. So as soon as they were invented, I, I was primed to go out and to start to use them to see uh, in what ways I could now um, apply um, laboratory phenomena and actually improve um, exam performance. So that was... Um, the environment in which first I had success and then I've mentioned I had failure, which got me to look around and say, oh, the, un 
the unintended social consequences of, of smartphones, which had led to unintended um, cognitive and, um, and classroom effects of, uh, of, small, of smartphones. In reality, it seemed like technological advancements had made teaching more difficult by making divided attention in the classroom the norm. And of course, this isn't just in the classroom. Today, we're all used to meeting a friend for a coffee and having to compete with their phone for attention. When I was in school, it was clearly understood by human beings in general that when you talk to someone, you look them in the eye. And when, you, and when someone was talking to you, you look them in the eye. And that was an absolute social rule. And to look away when someone was talking to you was, was, was a social transgression. And this was so well established that if you were in a classroom or a lecture hall and someone, the teacher was speaking at the front of the room, they just assumed that all eyes would be upon them and all the students would assume that they would be looking at the uh, uh, instructor. And in fact, if at some point someone actually turned to the person next to them to make a comment and they were um, noticed by the instructor or someone else having done that, they could well be called out. Someone could say, well, what are you doing? Uh, why don't you share it with all of us? Or even since you're not interested, please, please leave the room. Um, and so that was a very well understood um, social convention. Um, and I myself got, got called out from it. I mean, I wasn't perfect. I mean, there were times when I would, um, when the, the teacher would be saying something and I would actually have a book in my lap and I was trying to divide attention. And if the instructor um, saw me, they'd walk up to me and they'd take the book and close it up and carry it away because I wasn't supposed to be doing that. And I, I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Um, so that was a very strict um, social convention. And then cell phones were invented and um, uh, they began to have more and more interesting things on them. And uh, the people developed very strong habits for constantly checking them. And the you know, since then, the um, entire social convention of giving undivided attention to someone who was talking to you has simply completely eroded, eroded away. And it's obviously not part of society today at all. Um, look, I mean, you have um, such extreme cases as uh, uh, Benedict Cumberpatch stop, stopping a performance to tell the audience that it was extremely distressing to him to try and give a performance while people in the front rows were, ch were checking their cell phones during his performance. Uh, um, you know, so you can see the extent to which is eroding. I mean, people paid a lot of money for those tickets, but are still so um, habitually forced now to continually check their cell phones that, that they're dividing in a situation like that. Um, so. Um, so, yeah, so that whole convention has, has completely disappeared. And if theater goers can't concentrate on the performance of Benedict Cumberbatch for an hour without checking their phone, then it goes without saying that students were struggling to make it through Arnold's lecture without checking theirs too. Arnold knew from looking at previous research that by dividing your attention between more than one task, or multitasking as it's more commonly known, you learn less from all of those tasks. But this had never been explored specifically within a classroom setting. So was it as Arnold suspected that students were limiting their learning by using their phones, tablets, and laptops during lectures? He had to find out. And what better way to do so than to use that ongoing testbed of his own classroom? We'll delve further into exactly how Arnold did this after this short break. In this podcast, we explore the multitude of ways that research impacts the world, from the influence on political discussions to how it can revolutionize practices within a field, to how it can shape public opinion and worldviews. We believe that every researcher has the power to change the world in some way. And we want to help make that happen for you. 
That's why we've worked with the team at leading publisher Taylor and Francis Group to develop two free 12-week learning programs for researchers. If you're an early career researcher, our learning program delivers the complete guide to getting your research published and establishing your research profile. For mid-career researchers, our second learning program is a go-to guide for managing mid-career challenges, boosting the impact of your published work, and enhancing your research profile. Our learning programs are designed to fit your workload, so they're delivered to you online with one email each week for 12 weeks. That means you can access each chapter whenever it's most convenient for you. Plus, You can save emails and come back to them throughout your research career. Want to know more? Head to howresearchers.com slash learning dash programs. Before the break, Arnold had his suspicions that his students' use of phones, tablets, and laptops during class was having a negative impact on their final exam results. He tested this theory with a classroom experiment. What I did is I, what I always do when I go and I um, want to test a factor that may affect um, learning and memory, I teach the same class back to back Tuesdays and Thursdays. So on Tuesdays in one class, students were not allowed to use any electronic device. They could only pay attention to me. And on Thursday for the other class, students were not allowed to use any electronic device for an extraneous purpose. They could only pay attention to me. And then I looked at the performance for both classes on the exams. And uh, it was not a shock to discover that um, on the material that was presented on the days that students were allowed to ignore me, they did much more poorly than uh, than the exams that covered material on the days that they were uh, forced to pay attention. So that's the result that I wrote up um, that has appeared now in the um, report, uh, the effect of divided attention in the classroom. The effect is that if you divide attention in the classroom, you do more poorly on your unit exams and you do even more poorly on your final exam. By the final exam, the difference was 87 percent correct for material when students had to pay attention and only 80 percent correct when they were allowed to divide attention. That's a huge difference. 7% could easily mean the difference between one grade and the next. It's easy to see why the exam results of Arnold's students were decreasing, but you wouldn't think that something so small as checking your phone during class could have such a large impact on your final results. So why is this? And that's because the main, one of the effects of divided attention is specifically to um, affect long-term retention as opposed to immediate retention. So the further out in time you measure retention of what they learned, the greater the difference you get between people who were paying attention to one thing and people were dividing attention to more than one thing. Um, Unfortunately, because this effect is long-term, people are unaware of it um, in the moment. So in the classroom, even in the divided attention classroom, if I immediately asked a question on what I had just presented, even students with the, who were engaging in divided attention were still able to answer that question correctly. So naturally, they assumed that therefore they had learned it and remembered it just as well. And we remember it just as well because you don't have any intuition if you know something in the moment, whether you're going to still remember it a week or two weeks later. But that effect insidious effect is nevertheless there. So even though they thought they would remember it one or two weeks later, because in the moment they seemed to be aware of everything that was going on. In fact, two weeks later, performance is much poorer 
for a situation in which you divided attention. You essentially remember you were in that situation, you're dividing attention between the two tasks, but you remember very little of each task. And that's what led to the decline in exam performance for the students in, in the class. From his classroom experiment, Arnold had the first data to suggest that his hypothesis was correct that using phones, tablets, or laptops during classes was negatively impacting students' exam results because their attention was divided between multiple tasks. But what next? Could Arnold stop students using technology in classrooms? I had very good evidence that if if a student divided attention in class, they were going to do less well on their exams. And I also had pretty good evidence that the students themselves had no awareness of this effect and therefore would would, would doubt that it was true. And therefore, I felt that as, as a citizen, as someone who was doing all this as a teacher to help the students, that therefore there was a special obligation on me since I was the one who first got this finding to do anything I could to um, bring this to the public's attention. So at least people would be aware of this as a likely consequence of their action because I couldn't expect students to change their behavior if they had no awareness of the finding in the first place. Um, So um, I felt that it was um, up to me to make as many students as possible aware of this Um, So at least they appreciated that there was a genuine consequence to dividing attention in class, and then they could decide for themselves, at least, even if I wasn't going to get institutional rules in place, whether or not they wanted to engage in, in, in the behavior. It's fair to say that Arnold achieved this. He published his results in 2017, with a paper entitled Dividing Attention in the Classroom Reduces Exam Performance. Since publication, the paper has been read over 26,000 times. It's also made a huge splash in the media, with 45 news articles written about the paper, meaning Arnold's research was able to reach much further than his own academic field. Of course, This doesn't mean that there was a mass ban on mobile phones in classrooms. We we have a long way to go before people realize that 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 this is doesn't do anyone any good in the classroom and it should not uh, be uh, permitted. And and there will be pushback. Um, I heard a talk, a school district um, uh, made students when they came to school, they had these pockets where you can buy them from various vendors where they would put the cell phone in the pocket and they seal the pocket up and no one else could take the cell phone out because they had a lock on it. And at the end of the classroom day, they could go and they could open the pocket and take their, their, their cell phone and go about their business. And what the uh, very savvy uh, teachers and principal of the school discovered was that the students were bringing burner phones to class and putting them in the uh, pockets and, and keeping their real phones uh, to, to continue to, uh, to use them. But it's a great starting point for increasing our awareness and understanding about this important topic. And Arnold is very clear that more work needs to be done to further his research. I think a lot more research needs to be done because considering how important this is, um, it's amazing how little little research has been done on the effects of of new technologies. Um, It's... We have to distinguish between two kinds of research. One kind of research, well, even three kinds. One kind of research is, is survey research where you just, where you find out how much people are doing different kinds of things. The next kind of research is correlational research. You, you collect the information about different th- changes in society, and then you see what's correlated with what. Um, that's very useful to do, but Correlational research does not demonstrate cause and effect, and you can't really infer it um, from 
correlations. So then we come to the kind of experiments you need to do to understand what's actually happening in the world. Um, experimental studies where you manipulate a variable and therefore at the end you can determine cause and effect like I did in, in my experimental study. If you look at the number of experimental studies that have been done right, to demonstrate that um, divided attention in the classroom impairs um, um, exam performance. The answer is two, <laughs> and me and one other person, right, where they had a lot of control, a group of people at West Point uh, Military Academy, so they could, had good control. Um, other than that, there are no experimental studies. And I, that's terrible considering how important this is, world, this is in the world. Um, but there are no experimental studies because there's no national science agency that will fund experimental studies of this topic. There are, are no private philanthropies that will fund experimental studies of this topic. Um, it is, is difficult to get studies of this topic published in, in in prominent journals, um, this is just something that is not a priority for society or the world. And so it's just happening um, without any awareness or, or any intervention. And um, that's, that's a bad thing because the effects are much larger than anyone realizes, and they're not going to realize it because they never study it. Even though he acknowledges that further research needs to be done to persuade more and more people of the importance of this topic, Arnold remains positive about the power the research has to ultimately change the status quo. It's, it's hard to think of profound changes in history which don't go back to um, uh, fundamental uh, uh, scientific discoveries. Um, uh, and from the Renaissance forward, that's what's been driving progress. It's, it's been uh, scientific discovery um, all, all, all around the world. Um, um, and, and, it's, and it's not, you know, slowing up. This is one area where we really need that scientific discovery and progress. To find out more about this podcast and today's topic, visit howresearchers.com slash divided attention. In the next episode of How Researchers, we'll be speaking with Siarbin Brooks on her paper, Black on Black Love, Black Lesbian and Bisexual Women, Marriage and Symbolic Meaning. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn at How Researchers. This podcast was written and produced by Manchu and recorded at Under the Apple Tree Studios. Our producers were Ryan Howe and Tabitha Whiting, with editing, mixing, and mastering by Miles Myers Co. Harris at WBBC. We would like to acknowledge the incredible support of Taylor and Francis Group, with a special thank you to Elaine Devine and Claire Dodd. I'm Dr. Caitlin Regeer. Join us next time for How Researchers Change the World. Thanks for listening. Hello, listeners. This is Tabitha Whiting from the How Researchers Change the World team. We wanted to let you know that we're now going to be taking a short mid-season break and our next episode with Siarban Brooks will be out in four weeks' time. Make sure you subscribe to the How Researchers Change the World podcast on your podcast provider to be notified when the new episode is available in August. In the meantime, this is the perfect chance to go back and binge listen to any episodes you've missed. So far, we've covered research on music therapy and dementia, the p-values controversy, conservation and tree planting, the ethics of AI, art therapy and technology in the classroom. Whilst you're at it, we'd love to hear your feedback so that we can keep improving this podcast. So make sure you leave us a review or rating on your podcast provider. And if you're a budding researcher yourself, then don't forget to check out our 12-week learning programs at howresearchers.com. See you in August.